Hi, welcome to Eastside. Thank you for joining us on this glorious Sunday. I'm Blake. And I'm Amber. We've been members here at Eastside for quite a few years. Blake likes to serve on the technical team, and I've really enjoyed participating in the children's ministry as well as teaching over in the preschool. If you want to follow us a little bit closer, feel free to download our app at Eastside where you can follow the pastor's sermon, you can take notes, as well as give back to the church. You can also stay connected through following us on our website at followeastside.com. It's a great way to see us live stream. You can also participate with us on social media and we really enjoy seeing your comments on there too. So if you're joining us on social media or if you're here live, welcome and let's get ready to worship.
sing this to the Lord. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. of Jesus since I found in him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how he changed my life completely he did something that no other friend could do no to me with new assurance more and more I understand his words of love but I'll never know just why he came to save me till someday I see his blessed face above no one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he Today we continue our series, The Parables of Jesus. Today we look in the book of Matthew at the parable of the two servants. We go to Matthew chapter 24 and begin at verse 37 as we look at these two servants and some preamble to what Jesus had to say before the parable related to the signs of the times, the last days, the days before his physical second coming. In God's word, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, it says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven or the Son, 
but only the father. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And this is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the, at the hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch, be alert, because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time the thief, a time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Then we have the parable of the two servants. It begins at verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time. It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, a master is staying away for a long time. And then he begins to, to beat his fellow servants and to eat and to drink with drunkards. The master of the servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour he is not aware of and he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now to give us context to set the stage for this particular sermon, Jesus was asked a question earlier in chapter 24 that really gives us a sense of what this entire chapter and chapter 25 is all about. And it is about the second coming of Christ. The question that the disciples asked Jesus is this, what will be the sign of your coming and who, and, and, and what will be the sign of your coming and as to the end of the age? Jesus, when is it that you are going to come again? And so we find ourselves here in our church in another week exploring like we did last week the second coming of Jesus Christ, his physical coming back to earth, the beginning of, beginning of his millennial kingdom, which is also happening just after the end of the tribulation period. It is the focus, the second coming of Christ in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And these really are chapters of distinction, because what they say is this, basically, that when Jesus comes, some will be ready and others will not be ready. Some will be taken and others will be left. Some will be prepared for the coming of Jesus and others will not be prepared. But just like the, the game of tag or hide and seek, ready or not, here I come, Ready or not, the population of our world at that time, Jesus Christ is coming again. He is coming. And the text tells us that we do not know the day or the hour. Jesus himself does not know the day or the hour, nor do the angels. Only God the Father knows exactly when his second coming will take place. So in the context of all of this, Jesus in the verses we've just read unpacks for us three instructions as to what we should be doing in preparation for the Lord Jesus Christ. Two of the instructions are, are clear, and we'll see them in a moment. The third instruction comes in the form which matches up with our series. It comes in the form of a parable. So let's roll up our sleeves and get started, shall we? The first instruction for Christ followers as we await his return is to be alert. And that is packaged in verses 37 through 42. In fact, at the end of verse 42, Jesus specifically says, therefore, based on everything I've said in the earlier verses, be alert. And what Jesus does is he begins to compare 
the time in which Jesus will come again, a second time to this earth, he, he compares it, the second coming, to the days and the culture of Noah when Noah was building the ark before the flood. In fact, he makes references to the flood in verses 37 through 39. Now, the Bible tells us that before the flood happened in Genesis chapter 6, our world was filled with pronounced wickedness. It was awful and terrible. Jesus says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be when I physically come again. Pronounced wickedness all over the world. I would say we're getting closer every day in our world to the second coming of Jesus Christ because daily there is pronounced wickedness that is happening around us. And the world, when it comes to the second coming of Jesus Christ, is going to be so busy in this incredible wickedness and sin that the, the, the fact is that the world won't be looking for Jesus. The world won't be caring about others or caring about the things of God. The world will be unconcerned as to Bible prophecy and the coming of Jesus. In fact, most of the world uh, won't give it a thought. And I think that's the kind of world we live in today, which tells me that we're not too far away from the rapture of the church, where the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, is called up to meet the Lord in the air. Seven years of tribulation began at the end of that seven-year tribulation. You have the physical second coming of Jesus and the establishment of his millennial 1,000-year rule and reign on this earth. And I tell you, when you look at our world today, it is just wicked. There is wickedness everywhere, wickedness available everywhere, and instantaneous wickedness, and there is a pronounced bragging, um, um, celebrating of wickedness. Let's just see how wicked, let's just see how dark we can really be. No matter how clear God's word is taught in the culture of today, there is a prevailing mindset in our world, in our culture, not only to be blind to the things of God, but to oppose the things of God and to oppose it to the point that you condemn it, even to the point that you curse it. In Revelation chapter 9, John is speaking as to the final times and to this era and time preceding, just preceding the second coming of Jesus during the tribulation period. In Revelation chapter 9, verse 20, here's the culture, here's the mindset. It says, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons and idols, idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see, hear, or walk. Verse 21 says, in that time frame, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. Isn't that amazing? That is the, that is the time in which Jesus Christ will be so very soon after coming again to this earth. Wickedness everywhere. The people, regardless of, of what was preached, regardless of of Christ being the, the, the only hope of humankind, you find here that there is a mindset of people that did not stop worshiping demons, idols, or repent of their murders, magic, magic arts, sexual immorality, or their thefts. Literally, wickedness everywhere. Now, Jesus says in this particular path, a part of, of, of chapter 24 that it would be like the days of Noah. Later on, when Peter was writing to church leaders, he said about the, the end times. He said in, in uh, Second Peter chapter, uh, uh, First Peter, pardon me, chapter two, beginning at verse five, if he did not spare the ancient world, meaning God, when he brought the flood on its ungodly people, but protected Noah, who is a preacher of righteousness and seven others. He's talking about if God did not judge those if God judged those but did not judge, if God judged, pardon me, during the times of, 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 of the flood of Noah because of wickedness. Later he writes about Sodom and Gomorrah where God judged. If God did not judge 
what will happen before the second coming of Jesus Christ. You would always have to apologize, if you will, to the citizens around the flood time and the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. God is not going to allow ungodly behavior to continually be unchecked. This is Peter's point. Peter is making clear that Noah preached to those people. He lived God before those people. He built an ark as a visual that judgment was coming, but the people who were ungodly did not listen. And Jesus says that they ate and they drank and they married and they gave in marriage. In other words, they had a great time and they partied on. And they just had the best time and they partied right up to the time when Noah boarded the ark. And when the rain began to, con began to fall, they were still totally immersed in their culture of disobedience. And it wasn't until it became clear that the water was overwhelming that they began banging on the door of the ark, let us in, let us in. But the flood consumed them. Now, this is what Jesus is saying. The atmosphere, the context of culture will be like before he comes a second time to this earth. Now, Jesus talks about the flood, and then he moves to a second illustration in this passage about being alert, where he moves from talking about a flood to a field. And here is the point he makes in verse 40. He says, be alert of this. He says, uh, here's the snapshot. What I, want you to, what I want you to understand is that when I return, you need to be alert. Here, here's what's gonna happen. In a field, there will be two people working that field. One will be taken and the other will be left. Now, some people think this means the rapture taken up. I, I, I don't believe that's the context. I believe this is after the rapture at the end of the tribulation. When it says here that there'll be one in the field, one will be taken, the other left, I believe the one that will be taken is gonna be taken in, if you will, in, in the flood of God's judgment off the scene. And that is what is described here at the end of uh, chapter 24. We'll come to it at the end of the message today. Um, unbelievers will be, will be taken away. One, there'll be two people there. One's a believer, one's not a believer. The unbeliever will be taken away and the believer will stay and be left to help begin the millennial kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's the same with two women at the hand mill, the illustration here. One will be taken away in judgment and the other will be left to help start the millennial kingdom. Two will be on the assembly line. One will be taken, the other will be left. Two will be in the office or office cubicle and one will be taken and the other will be left. Now that's what Jesus does. Jesus talks about a flood and he talks about a field. He says, you need to be alert. You need to really pay attention to what is happening around you. Be alert because Jesus says, I'm coming again and I will come in the context of the days of Noah where there is wickedness everywhere and I will judge those that will be taken away and don't believe and who have created such riotous lives. And I will preserve and install into my millennial kingdom those that are staying behind. And then you have this hook, this word, therefore. You see it there at verse 42. Therefore, based on what I've taught about the field and what I've taught about the flood, therefore, based on everything I've said, in the preceding verses, Jesus says, be alert. He says, be alert. Keep watch. Watch your surroundings. Watch your culture. Because you don't have any idea what is the day or the hour of his coming. Now, let's go from that first instruction to be alert to a second instruction, and that is be ready. Jesus is telling his disciples, his followers to be ready. It's found there in verse 44, you must be ready. Now, this portion of scripture here is Jesus says that I'm gonna come as a thief in the night and people aren't looking. They're not, if, you're not, if you're not prepared for a thief, the thief will, will come and be gone before you even know it. Here's what I know in the United States just two years ago, the most recent figure I could find that we spent in this nation, fellow citizens, $21 billion on home security. That's back in the year 2019. Over $21 billion on home security. The reason we do that is because we don't want to be in a situation where someone would come to our house, 
break in and steal. So with that home security system connected to our phones, connected to our tablets, connected to our, our laptops, or, compared, or, or connected to our desktop computers, we want to be ready. We want to be able to see what's going on. We want to hear what's going on. We want to be ready. We don't want a thief to take advantage of us. Now, Jesus is not saying that he has the character of a thief here. That's not the point. What Jesus is saying is that he is going to come back to this earth in an unexpected time. He's going to come like a thief. He's going to be stealth. It's going to, to happen for those that are busy and not paying attention. He's going to come like a thief. And a thief is successful if he or she comes when they are not expected. During the tribulation period, those who come to Christ need to be ready for the physical return of Jesus. There will be people who will be saved during the tribulation period. There'll be 144,000 missionaries who go throughout the world, evangelize the world after the church has been raptured out. And they will share Christ and people will be converted in what will be a hellish, demonic, horrible atmosphere, incredible persecution on people who are trying to crawl their way to the Lord by repentance and faith in the tribulation period. Jesus is reminding them that they need to be ready. He is going to come like a thief in the night, his second coming. He will end the tribulation and it'll happen where everybody's distracted, everybody's looking all around, but to his born agains, to his new creations, to his followers on this earth, you need to be ready. You need to be ready because Jesus is coming. That's true of those of us who believe the next big event on the God's prophetic calendar is the rapture, which we believe could happen before we finish this broadcast today. All the biblical prophecy has been fulfilled for there to be the rapture of the church for Jesus Christ and the saints, Jesus Christ to come from heaven to the air, and we, his saints, be raptured to be with him and go to heaven while this tribulation period unfolds here on this planet. We need to be alert for Jesus is coming in the air and we need to evangelize. We need to share our faith. We need to do everything we can to see as many people are called to heaven with us because they have saving faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, Luke says in his gospel, be dressed in readiness, keep your lamps lit. So we need to be dressed in readiness. We need to be ready. In a uh, small country store here in the South, a local church going lady was shopping and a couple of good old boys were taunting her, disrespectful, kind of making fun of her. Actually, they were. They knew she was a Christian. They knew she loved Jesus. And they said to her mockingly, quote, we hear you're expecting Jesus to come back. She said, I sure am. And then they said sneeringly, well, you better get ready and get on home because he might be on the way, ha, ha, ha. She turned to her mockers and said, I don't have to get ready. I keep ready. That's what Jesus wants us to do is keep ready. At the end of the at the end of the message with some practical points, I want to talk about how do we keep ready? Well, what's the best way to, 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 to live the Christian life in these days as we await the return of the Lord Jesus Christ? Keep ready. This is what Jesus is teaching his disciples. He's saying, keep ready. Don't, don't run off and, and, and go to some retreat and live a monastic life looking for the return of Jesus. Don't spend your time staring at the sky, just waiting for the clouds to unroll and unfold for Jesus to come. No, no, you need to be about keeping ready. Keep ready. Be ready at all times. And so the first instruction was to be alert. The second instruction for us as we wait for the return of the Lord Jesus is to, is to be ready. Then the third instruction is actually what leads us to the parable. And that is 
be faithful. Until Jesus comes again, be faithful. And we look at verses 45 through 51, and we see this instruction of being faithful is delivered into the parable in the format, the platform of the parable of the, of the two servants. Verse 45, you have Jesus describing a faithful servant and then later giving the narrative of an unfaithful servant. Uh, theologians call this an eschatological, meaning last times parable. Eschatological parable, end times parable. Here is the parable, ready? We've read it, let's recap it. There is an owner who has a servant that he trusts. In fact, he puts the servant over all his other servants. And when the owner goes out of town and returns unexpectedly, maybe more earlier than what the good servant had thought, the faithful servant had thought, he returns unexpectedly, the owner finds this faithful servant doing exactly what he's supposed to be doing, looking after his household, his servants, and making sure primary responsibility was that they were, were fed. And because that servant was faithful and he did what he was supposed to do while the master was away, fulfilling the master's desires, the owner turns around and puts this faithful servant in charge of all of his property and all of his possessions. Then Jesus flips it and we see another profile of a unfaithful servant. This is a servant who has been given instructions and also knows that his owner is away and he thinks the owner is going to stay longer than thought and that there's going to be lots of margin in this unfaithful servant's life to kind of do what he wants to do and not take care of what the master wants while he's away. And so he thinks and says, you know what? We'll, we'll all just drink until we get drunk. And we'll just corral as much as we want to. We'll eat, we'll party. We'll just do that a lot. Sounds a lot like the days of Noah that Jesus was speaking of earlier. And without even thinking about it, he just goes about living this decadent life of evil and sin and um, forgets that the master's gonna come home. Well, at a time when the servant didn't think the master would show, he shows. And when he sees what his servant had done with his possessions and his people, he had seen the condition in which things were and that he had been unfaithful. Jesus says that he rebukes this servant and he cast him into a very hard judgment. More about that in a moment. Now let's, as we try to do these parables, let's, let's look here at this third instruction, this third instruction, which is to be faithful. Let's line up and see what is in the parable compared to the spiritual truth or the player that the parable's illustration represents. Here's what we believe to be true. The master in the story, the landowner, the house owner, the master equals or is the Lord Jesus himself. The faithful servant represents a believer who serves in the master's house. The unfaithful servant is an unbeliever that is acting like a believer in some ways, but is hypocritical because when the master is away, he isn't being faithful. So there is not integrity or wholeness in this unfaithful servant's life. So his eternal relationship with Jesus Christ is questionable. Now we then have here the servant, the faithful servant doing his job. And as the faithful servant is doing his job, guess what? He is rewarded by the master. This is very consistent when Jesus talks about faithful servants, faithful slaves, doulos, faithful servants of Jesus. They are rewarded. 
We had a funeral here of a marvelous, godly man just a few days ago, right in this room. The room was, was, was just filled with people, uh, even with the social distancing, there was a fullness in the room. Great turnout. And the thing we said about this man who'd been a part of our church for all of his life, almost all of his adult life, really all of his adult life, we, we said to him that he was faithful. He was a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. And he was rewarded with a great reputation here on earth and rewarded with heaven being his home after he died. And then you have, again, the unfaithful servant. You see the servant who does not do his job. And the servant who does not do his job is severely punished. Look at that outline there. From the master all the way down to the unfaithful servant. And that's what you have going on in this parable of the two servants. Jesus says, reward and blessing goes to the faithful. So Christ follower, be faithful. For those of us that await the rapture of the church, be faithful. Be faithful in serving the Lord Jesus Christ, our master. Well, let's draw this thing now to a, to a conclusion with a question that Jesus himself asked at the beginning of verse 45. You see it there, look at it in verse 45. Jesus asks, who then is the faithful and wise servant? Who then is the, the wise and faithful, faithful and wise servant? Who is this person? That is a great question. We could take that question and ask, what does he look like as they wait for Jesus to return? What does she look like? What do they look like as they wait for Jesus to return? What do they who are faithful need to be doing? What are they that are faithful and wise need to be doing while they are waiting for the master to return to this earth? Well, there are a couple of points here. In, 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 in verse 45, you see that this particular servant, the faithful servant, was providing food for the master's household. Providing food for the master's household. Let me speak to every Bible teacher in our church, every one of our pastors, anyone involved in discipleship, anyone that is involved in pouring your life into another. When you think of the church as the household of God, when you think of the food being the word of God, milk and meat, when you think of the Bible teachers, faithful servants, one of the things that we must be faithful in doing is to give the word of God to our people. Until Jesus returns, we must continue to distribute the word of God. For some on their spiritual journey, there will be the milk of the word because they're babes and infants in Christ. For others, it will be the meat of the word as we take them through the disciplines of the Christian faith, learning the word, learning systems of how to study the word. I tell you, what do we need to be found as a faithful servant doing? We as faithful servants need to be committed to teaching the word of God. It is not coincidental that Paul says that in the last days before Jesus comes again, that there will be people who will come to church and they will want teachers who will basically scratch their ears because their ears will be itching. They, want, they, 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 they don't want real food. They, they want stories and they want this or that, but they, 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 they want motivations, but they don't want the word of God. And he tells us until Jesus comes again to preach and teach the word and do it in season and out of season, doing it when it may be popular, do it when it, isn't not, when it isn't popular, but just continue to be faithful to teach the word. 
So what do we do while we're waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ? We continue to proclaim and teach and preach and disciple using the word of God. Then there is a second facet of this that I think is interesting. What, do, what, what does that faithful servant do while waiting for Jesus to return? What do we do as a church while we wait for the rapture to take place until that day that Jesus calls us home? One of the best ways that we can spend our time waiting for Jesus to come home, to take us home rather, is simply to take care of other people. I'm talking about serving, volunteering, treating people well. That's what this faithful servant was doing to other members of the household. He was treating them well. He made sure that they got fed. He made sure the property was taken care of. He made sure that there was in their lives, in their workspace, in their living space, everything they needed. He was responsible for that, like the master, to make sure that they were looked after. And I tell you, as a, as a church family, not only can we be faithful to teach the word of God, but let us be faithful to try to make other people's lives better. Let's volunteer. Let's help those that don't have what we have. Let's try to roll up our sleeves to speak into the lives of people who are broken and struggling to find the single mother who needs help, to find the children who are orphaned, to, to minister and care for widows and for those that have brokenheartedness, those that are sick, those that are, that, are, that are dying physically. You want to be a faithful servant until Jesus comes? Be faithful teaching, proclaiming the word of God, studying the word of God, and be faithful in helping other people. Now, the opposite of the unfaithful servant is that he didn't do that. He actually mistreated people. And when the master came and found that he was mistreating people, it says in verse 51, because he abused his privilege, that he would be cast into death, and into destruction. That's in verse 51. I want to read that. It says that he, the master, will cut to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites, which would be like the Pharisees and Jesus' contemporary teachings at that time, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The master is upset that one of his servants mistreated people and abused his privileges, and as a result, the master does what? Look at this. He casts that servant into death and destruction. It's not pleasant to say, but this is hell. This is a description of hell. All unbelievers eventually will be cast and are destined to hell. So there is the parable of the faithful steward. And Jesus reminding his disciples directly and us now directly through the word that as we wait for his coming, as we in this context today, as we wait for his rapture, we too can take counsel from the words of Jesus says, all right, with everything that is going on today, with all the unbelief that is happening today, with all the disbelief that is going on regarding me, Jesus says, be alert, be ready, and be faithful to the word, and be faithful to serve others. That's the parable of the two servants. God bless you, thanks for listening. Thank you, Dr. Hall, for such a wonderful message. Just a reminder, Eastside family, next Sunday, March 14th, is Daylight Savings. So don't forget to set your clocks accordingly so you don't miss out on our services, which are live streamed at 9, 30, 11, and 6. So thank you guys for being with us and being part of the Eastside family. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday and being our prayers.